let's talk about the, the video side of things because mm. I mean I, I think I think anybody who sees any of your videos is like, oh that that looks really nice. I mean as somebody who makes videos in their spare time and I look at it and I'm like, Ugh. I look at yours and I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. And it wasn't until I got to Friedman sort of this year that I realized that you really do know what you're doing. So how did you get into video production? Like what is and and yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very, very interesting sort of thing because we live in this time where anybody can do anything with a camera and yeah. yet very few people probably know that, that well. So yeah, go, go into how you sort of ended up in that world. So the first thing you need to know about me is I don't have a grand plan. Uh, in the words of the Joker, <laughs> in the words of the Joker, do I look like a man with a plan? Um, <laughs> so I was getting towards the end of what would turn out to be a seven year stint driving forklifts, working in a warehouse, being very blue collar, pissing off the local uh, union representative as often as I could, um, you know, sort of living in that world. And I'd worked my way into kind of lower middle management there. And, and I was, had gone from being a picker packer on the floor through being a forklift driver. And I moved up into being a, um, a, a shift supervisor there. And, and, um, then one day my cousin came to me and said, Chris, I used to do acting when I was much younger and my cousin also did. And he came to me and he said, Chris, we've got a real problem. I'm a, he, my cousin was a part of a, a rendition of the importance of being earnest, the stage play. And, um, they were desperate for more male actors because they didn't have enough to actually fill out the cast. I'm thinking, okay, great. So not only is this some crappy local theater production, it's a crappy local theater production that doesn't even have enough pull to get actors when actors are some of the most des- <laughs> desperate people around to just, I'll do anything. Okay. How do you, how do you yeah, not get yeah, actors? Yeah. He was persistent. My cousin, Bob, bless his heart. He'll never see this. So um, he was persistent. I went and auditioned. I hadn't acted in many, many years by then. And I did the worst audition of my life and I was so desperate they gave me two roles. Not one, two. <laughs> oh, one wow. in the first act and a different one okay. in the second act. That's how bad things were. It turned out to be a brilliant production. And I, I don't mean to brag, but it was freaking phenomenal. And by popular demand, we had to come back. So we were part of the comedy festival in Melbourne. We sold out. Uh, so our first week was a little bit slow, but word got around and the second week was sold out. And then the, we came back by popular demand the following oh. year and had two weeks of, of sold out shows. Um, so the, the production itself worked out really well, but what that did was it kind of reignited something that seven years in warehousing and logistics and working my way up into management and now wearing a shirt and tie had kind of started to kill. Uh, and that was that at heart, I'm, I'm a bit of a dag and I'm a bit of a creative and I'm a bit of a larrikin and I'm, I'm lots of different things. Um, and I do not belong in, in the corporate world and I do not belong in the, in the shirt and tie um, cut and thrust of climbing the greasy pole, whether that be politics or corporate or whatever it might be. And I, it, I, I found my spark again, so to speak. So as a consequence of doing that, that same cousin Bob got somehow through his connections, he got an email that informed him that the ABC, through Andrew Denton's project Next, which I think became Angry Beast, it had a rename before it came out, mm, were, yeah, yeah, were yeah. looking for the next generation up-and-coming television presenters. And I thought, you know what? I'll give it a go. I'll, I'll apply. By then, I was politically aware enough to know that I did not have much in common with the ABC. And I did not want to just be a mouthpiece for opinions that I actually didn't, didn't agree with. I wanted to know that they were going to give me the editorial freedom if I was going to be a, a face and a journalist uh, for them, that I wanted to know that I was going to have editorial freedom. So I specifically, part of the application process was you had to make a video. So I specifically made a video that I knew would piss them off. Uh, And that was the very first unpopular view video that I did that was all about the desalination plant down here in Victoria and the fact that we should not have built a desalination plant to to deal with the water crisis. We should have built a dam on the Mitchell River, uh, which, of course, upsets all the right people when you're when you're me. Um, I sent that off to Project Next, and um, I'm not even sure if I got a rejection from them. I I doubt it. Um, It's many years ago now. (laughs) I certainly never got a job offer from them. So I put the video up online on it. I started up a YouTube channel. That was the first piece of content that went on there. And I kind of went, eh, okay, there you go. I, I tried. I did my thing. You know, either I was crap and they didn't want me or they saw my politics and they didn't want me or for whatever reason, they didn't want me. That's fine. And me not having a master plan kind of went, okay, well, I'll just find the next thing. I'll, I'll, I'll do something else. People started watching the video. And this, to this day, remains the most confusing episode of my life. I don't know who they were. I don't know how they found the video. And then some of them found my phone number. Now, my phone number was not attached to that video. There was no, I, this is the most confusing chapter of my life. 
my phone started ringing every second or third day. And there weren't a lot of people watching this video. It hadn't gone like viral worldwide. A couple of hundred yeah, yeah. people had watched my video. I got a phone call from someone saying, I need you to make a video about this road that they're putting in down near Frankston and something to do with the acquisition of his property and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm sorry. A, how did you get my number? B, <laughs> who am I? Why are yep. you getting on the phone to me and saying, mm. help me? Because no one else is, no one else can. And I had no resources and, and that's still true. Um, and, and so I said, look, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not your guy. I can't help you. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm not your guy. I got a couple of other phone calls about a couple of other issues. People, something about the way that I did that video, people looked at it and went, I need him on my side on my issue, whatever it was that, that, that they were facing at the time. And eventually I got a, an email, I believe it was, and a woman by the name of Jan Beer had managed to get my contact details and she was the head of the Plug the Pipe Coalition, which was to do with a water pipeline going from the irrigation district in the north of Victoria down to Melbourne. It was a very political issue at the time. It was The pipe was a terrible idea to begin with. She had done some incredible research. She put it in front of me. I went through it. I went to try and invalidate it. I couldn't invalidate it. And I just felt compelled. I have to make a video about this. So I made the second of the Unpopular View videos all about the North-South Pipeline. And that really, that was where it began. One thing led to another. I was teaching at the time, um, I was teaching a certificate two in computer science to 55-year-olds, people who were without a job um, and their previous job hadn't required any computer skills and now they needed to find another job. They weren't old enough to retire or they didn't have enough money to retire, but they had to have basic computer skills to get a job. I was, te I was teaching them how to turn a computer on, how to get onto the internet, how to receive an email, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I was going, jumping in a car and driving all over Victoria, making videos about, you know, based on a combination of my research and, and research that other people had collated for me uh, about different aspects of the water situation down in Victoria. And that genuinely, as dumb as that is, and as, as non-purposeful as that is, like I'd love to tell you the skies parted and the light shone on me and I, and I had a word from God, but I didn't. I just, I kind of followed my nose. I, I made a silly little thing and, and people saw in it something that I didn't see in it and I, I still don't to this day, but they saw something in it and they got in touch with me. Um, I made the second video about the North South Pipeline. The funny thing was Jan Beer, the head of the, that coalition, she ran as an independent in the um, state um, seat in that area uh, in the following state election. And um, she got enough votes as an independent. She directed her preferences across to the Liberal Party, which were against the pipeline, and the Labor Party were the ones that were building it. Um, and Labor lost by a single seat. And depending on who you ask, the reason Jan got as many, and, and if you ask Jan, the reason she got as many votes as she did was because of that video. And she was able to use that video as a campaigning tool effectively to attract votes to herself, which she then passed on to the Liberals, and the Liberals won the seat and they won the state. So in a roundabout kind of way, my second video that I made as a kid who knew nothing, I was I was my own cameraman, just to give you some picture, all right? I'm running around with a camera called the Sony Z1P on a tripod, and I would set up the camera. And back then, I didn't even have an external microphone. I was just using the microphone that was on the camera. And so I had to make sure I was close enough to the camera when I was talking. And then to kind of make it fun and funky, I would do the same line like four or five different times in different places with different backgrounds. Or sometimes I'd lock off the tripod, it'd be the same shot. And I would do it in four or five different places, different distances from the camera and stuff. And then I'd just edit them together. And so I'm kind of jumping around the screen saying different stuff. But I had to use the audio from the take that was the closest to the camera because that was the only one where you could actually hear what I was, what I was saying. So I was just, I was mucking my way through this and struck, mm. struck a nerve. And it wasn't until Tim kind of got in touch with me that this began. And that was after, I believe it was after my fifth video about the water crisis. So I, I had done a bit of stuff then. Um, and Tim kind of saw my stuff and he got in touch with me and said, Hey, listen, there, there are other issues out there that kind of need your touch and need your attention. And like Jan Beer back in the early days, something about Tim made me go, okay, I'm going to listen to you in a way that I hadn't listened to a lot of other people. Um, and yeah, one thing led to another and, and I somehow became the libertarian video guy. And I, 
I, I am utterly unqualified for that. I have no training. Well, that's not true. My dad was in TV when I was a kid. So as a teenager and, and as like a 10 year old, um, I was involved in like Channel 31 community TV sort of stuff as a kid. So I, I had a little bit of a technical background from that. But in terms of being a communicator, in terms of being able to research and write these things and produce them, and you know, it, 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 it actually was a source of annoyance for me. I, I have always had a real sense when it comes to the videos that there should be no room for me to do what I'm doing. If journalists and professional commentators and the people trained to do this kind of stuff were actually doing their jobs, there would have been no room for me. People would have looked at me and gone, whatever. The only reason anyone ever paid any attention to me, as crap as I as I am at what I do, and technically things have gotten a lot better, but I still look at myself as a presenter and go, okay, yeah, right. Um, there should have been no room for me. The professionals should have been debating all of these yep. issues and presenting all of these ev- this evidence and, and tackling all of this stuff. The pros should have been all over it. Uh, and it's only because of their failure that there was ever any room for me in that space at all. Well, I mean, that sounds about as libertarian as you could possibly get, though. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> like you, we, we, we believe this this concept of this sort of spontaneous order where you've kind of got all these people doing all these different things and it somehow comes together to form this the, all these outcomes that people want. And so I actually think it sounds perfectly libertarian that, you, you, you know, you just happen to come across incidentally this this niche where people were hungering for something that you were able to provide even though you thought that somebody else could do a better job i mean i, I think that's i mean yes, that's something you're I spot think. on I mean, you're spot on it's you're far more successful to me but like yeah no look i, oh, sorry, I yeah, yeah. yeah i i i agree with what you're saying but it still blows my mind that's that i guess is what i'm saying yeah, i yeah. i don't see i don't see yeah. in my work what some other people see i mean plenty of people look at my work and go meh whatever but there is a there, there is a percentage of people that look at my work and go yes i identify with you and a lot of the feedback that i get is you know thank you for saying what i've been thinking but didn't know how to say it that's if i had to distill the feedback that i get um, well probably the number one piece of feedback that i get is shut up your wanker um, but putting that one aside <laughs> Um, in terms of positive feedback, probably the biggest the biggest theme is thank you for saying what I've been thinking but haven't known how to how to say it. Um, so clearly yeah. there there was room. Clearly there there is a large segment of people who feel that they do not have any representation in the media landscape at all. Yeah. So how did that progress then? Because I mean, I, I just. I- briefly brought up your uh your U- youtube channel and like you can see just even looking at like the the uh the the sort of the snippet that they show you when you've got it sort of the list screen like clearly you have progressed in your skills so how did how did that happen like at what point did you like okay i want to learn more about this stuff like where did you go to sort of develop your skills so i attempted to freelance as a video guy not at the technical end of things but at the the comms end of things because I started to realize that around about my, my fifth unpopular view video, I started to realize as crap as what I'm doing is, it's resonating and people see a purpose for it and people see yep. a place for it. So maybe being the libertarian that I am and the capitalist that I am, if there really is a demand for this, then maybe I can actually get a living out of this. Boy, was I wrong. Uh, but I tried. <laughs> I attempted for four years to be a freelancer and... Um, um, I, I genuinely have lost count of the number of times my water got cut off and they take a long time to cut off water um, over that four year period. I, <laughs> I was I was renting in the inner northern suburbs of Melbourne. I had housemates who ended up hating me because um, the, the internet would get cut off, the water would get cut off, different things got cut off. Um, I had the most irregular income in the world. I ended up working as a barista in a cafe where the boss as the, he's, he's another most libertarian thing in the world. Uh, the boss was paying me a fraction of minimum wage and was stealing everybody's tips, um, you know, just to try and just to try and make ends ends meet. So I, I failed spectacularly as a as a freelancer in in this world. Did a couple of good projects along the way. It was in that window where uh, I did the the um, Forbidden History series. Um, that was also the period of time where I finally got an answer to some of the health issues that I'd had before. And there was a whole kind of another chapter of my life in and around that. Um, came out of that four years, 
um, got engaged to my to my now lovely wife, who I'd known for, for six years when we got engaged. I'd known her since since back when I was driving the forklift. Um, and around about that time, felt the responsibility of having to be a grown up human being and have a consistent income. And so I took a full time job in a video production company. Right. The only way that I can answer the crux of your question, though, so that just gives you a bit of the landscape. Okay, I stepped out of being seven years in mm. logistics. I became a freelancer for four years trying to find people who needed my services, failed spectacularly at that, but did some good work along the way, kind of met a bunch of people along the way. So I also I studied acting for a year through the early part of the actually while I was still driving a forklift um, and sort of got back into that world, made a lot of connections the, the key answer to the question, though, is that through this messy, weird period of my life where I was out of it for months due to health and I was broke most of the time and I was blah, 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 I never stopped learning. And if I can say anything for homeschooling, in my opinion, which I was, I was homeschooled from the start of uh, grade four in primary school all the way through, I never went back to school. I lied about my age when I was 13 to get a full-time job um, at flipping, you know, making pizzas at Pizza Hut. If I can say anything about homeschooling, it's that it really equips you to learn no matter what. So all of what you see now in terms of the technical quality of what I can do, of which this image is not a, a representation, um, my, my camera image right here right now, no. Um, you know, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. The lighting could be better. I'm using a bedside lamp. Um <laughs> The, yeah, and I, I think the storm's doing crazy things through your internet because it's not helping you either, it seems. No, um, but but I just watched and I learned and I listened and I, I kind of cultivated mm. the technical skills. Then I took a full-time job in a um, video production company and they, they needed a sales guy. Um, and it turns out that um, I can kind of sell things. So I was able to go in and... Um, start to get them into bigger and bigger companies than they'd ever been into before. And by the time I finished up with them three years later, they had contracts with you know household names that I won't name, but but you know in multinational companies that are you know whether they're in transport and logistics, in uh, musical instruments, in uh, sport and entertainment, and other kind of things. And I was just able to walk into whether it was a, the head of a department or whether it was in, in a minority of cases at a board level and walk into a room and actually just sell to these people and convince them to use our services in video production. And then they would put in front of me what they needed to communicate. And I was able to use the skills that I had developed over four years of failing as a, as a freelancer to be able to take this incredibly dry, boring message where they wanted to sell more widgets. And they wanted to tell the world that their widget is better because it does X instead of Y. And everyone's going to fall asleep if they try and say it the way they think they need to say it <coughs> and kind of get them to to just say a little bit better, you know. And I wasn't I wasn't acting as some creative agency. We didn't come out with some award-winning creative concepts. We took the bog standard boring video and we made it a little bit better. And we did a good job. And the company, you know, grew and and um, we the, the quality of the clients that we had improved. <coughs> and I would walk out on set and I would direct these shoots, completely unqualified. Um, but... I had watched enough directors and I had watched enough content and I knew how to match my shots and I knew how to tell a story and I knew how to change which shot I wanted to use to get a certain dramatic effect, all of it from watching other people do it. So I was able to go out and direct these corporate videos and direct it successfully, direct them successfully and have the clients come back and, and want more. Um, so the answer to your question, how did I develop these skills? I just bloody well paid attention um, mm. <laughs> to life. I watched as life happened yep. around me and and learned. I had the the absolute pleasure of um, of directing a, a short film that I wrote uh, called The Hustle that made the finals of the 2013 uh, Tropfest Film Festival, um, and that would nice. that's the pinnacle of my my kind of creative career. Most of it's been crappy corporate stuff, but that yep. that was a finalist in Tropfest. It was a finalist in the Austin International Film Festival in Austin, Texas. It was a finalist in the Los Angeles Festival of Cinematic Arts a finalist in the St Kilda Film Festival and a finalist in um, the Love Your Shorts Film Festival has been played now in the US, in Japan, and has been broadcast twice in Australia. So I've, I've kind of, but that's as far as I've gotten. Wow, like I, I, had a, I had a short film that did well. Um, and you don't, get, yep. you don't get paid for short films, for the record, you know. Uh, and and <laughs> what I started to realise, as I'd now attempted freelancing, I'd attempted acting, and I was now working as a sales rep and a, and a writer director in a commercial 
co- a corporate video production company with aspirations of getting into film, I had a shocking realization that working in film, in video, in television is a really enjoyable way to be broke. Uh, you have no trouble being busy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you, but you will forever be broke. Um, and so thus yeah. about two and a half years ago began a journey that we'll be, we'll be talking about in a minute where I had another idea for another industry where I know that people are making lots of money. Um, and I decided to stretch my entrepreneurial wings and, and go and play in that space. <laughs> 